My name is Benjamin Berger, and this is a copy of my senior honors thesis that I wrote when I was in college back in 1996. I was about 22 years old when I wrote it, and it's my first scientific investigation into a, a very common fossil that I became fascinated, maybe maybe a little obsessed with, and it got me in the door of being a scientist for the first time. It's not my, my finest work, um, but you know, reading it tw almost 25 years later, um, it's surprisingly well written, um, but it, it got rejected um, in peer review, so it was never formally uh, published. Um, but it was my first forte uh, into conducting a paleontology research project on my own. And I was super excited about this study. Um, and so today I thought I would talk about it and talk about why very common fossils are important to study. So my first official paleontology expedition to collect fossils was in 1995. Um, I was hired uh, for this summer as an assistant to a graduate student and his professor who were mapping and collecting fossils in a remote region of Wyoming. And while helping them with research, I found a tiny fossil mammal jaw with petrified teeth. So I asked them, you know, what is this? And they said, well, it's a small mammal called Hyopsidus. And I said something like, well, what is a Hyopsidus? And they said, well, it's a condylarth. And I said, well, what is a condylarth? And they said, well, you know, no one knows for sure. There's a lot of debate in the literature, blah, blah, blah. So it was an open invitation to learn more about this creature when I got back to the library. Hyopsidus is one of the most common fossils in museum collections, with fossils known across Asia, Europe, and North America. It is ubiquitous in early Eocene terrestrial rock units, comprising sometimes 60 to 80, sometimes 90 percent of the fossils collected from these localities. It is a small terrestrial mammal that looked remarkably similar to living guinea pigs with a short tail and adaptations for digging or hiding in the prehistoric forests that covered the northern hemisphere during the warm early Eocene epoch. The animal is more closely related to horses belonging within the mesiaxial ungulate clade uh, where the axis of support in the foot uh, in the feet is down the central toe. Hyopsis was the last archaic ungulate condylarth mammal. Condylarthra is an order of mammals named by Edward Cope to describe a group of fossils that were ancestral to later parasodactyls that today include uh, horses, and tapirs, and rhinoceroses. So it's, it's pretty amazing that this prehistoric tiny mammal is more closely related to living rhinoceroses than to a mouse. Hyopsidus went extinct uh, by the late Eocene as the climate cooled and the thick forest habitat of the, of the whole Arctic uh, disappeared, replaced by open grasslands. It was during this later period of the Eocene that Hyopsis disappeared and it was replaced by uh, early rabbits and pikas, which appear for the first time in the late Eocene. Fossils of the teeth preserve readily because the teeth are made of tough material called enamel. Uh, fossils comprising teeth of both the lower or upper jaws are really common. And because this fossil is a mammal and the teeth are easy to identify, they're often picked up and collected by field workers. Often fossils, which are perhaps more common on the outcrop, are often left in place because they can't be easily identified, or they're just not interesting to collectors. This positive collecting bias for Hyopsis specimens has resulted in hundreds of thousands, perhaps over several million specimens, collected and cataloged in museums around the world. Why are common fossils like Hyopsis so important? What can they tell us about evolution? 
When I learned that hyopsis was very common and there were literally thousands of specimens in the museum filling hundreds of drawers, I knew that I had a great research project because I knew that these specimens were all collected from different stratigraphic positions with precise locality information. And that because of that, you could study evolutionary change through long periods of time. During the 1970s and into the 1990s, hyopsis became a hot topic for paleontologists studying the rates of evolution. In 1972, Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould published a famous paper arguing that evolutionary rates were very quick, but spaced between long periods of no evolutionary change. This hypothesis was called punctuated equilibrium, and it was based on Niles Eldridge's study of the very common fossil trilobite, Phacops, from the Devonian, and Stephen Jay Gould's study of the very common fossil snail, Pociliozonites, from the Pleistocene of the Caribbean. Punk eek, as the theory later came to be known as, suggested that evolutionary change was very quick. But once an organism had changed, it often remained unchanging for long periods of time. Punk eek was an extension of genetic experiments done with fruit flies by Theodorus Dabowski and published in his Genetics and the Origin of Species in 1937. When population size is small, advantageous or even just slightly advantageous mutations or unique and novel traits can more quickly become fixed within the entire population. So imagine a population of fruit flies where 10 individuals are red and the rest are black. If the population size is 10,000, then only a very few red flies will be found. They will remain a rare component of the population throughout new generations, about one in a thousand. Although this will of course change through time. However, if the population size decreases to only 20 flies and one of those individuals is red, then one in 20 of the population will be red. And there's a much greater chance that the whole population could become entirely composed of red individuals with future generations. When populations are large, it takes a much longer period of time and it is less likely for these changes to be seen across the entire population because they remain just in the background, just a small subset of the population. When populations become small, these traits can become amplified and may over just a few generations extend across the entire population, becoming a defining new character for the species. It is this theory in evolution where we get the concept of peripatric speciation, that species often originate in small little geographic isolated populations where a new trait is more likely to encapsulate the entire population over a shorter period of time, just a few generations, and come to characterize a new species with a defining novel trait. In the fossil record, you don't often see this stepwise or gradual change because fossilization becomes more improbable the smaller the population size. So it's much more likely that a population of 10,000 individuals will leave a fossil record than a population of just 20. So it is manifested in the fossil record as punctuated events followed by equilibrium or, or stasis. However, in 1974, Phil Gingrich of the University of Michigan published a study of Hyopsidus from the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming, arguing for the case for gradual evolution. Gingrich's study looked at the area of the first lower molar and noticed gradual change in tooth size over time. 
It was in direct contradiction to the studies of fossil snails and trilobites, which showed rapid change followed by stasis. A lot of scientists criticized the Hyopsidus study, particularly because it looked at the area or size of the lower first molar tooth and transformed it with a logarithmic scale. A, a logarithmic scale spreads the data points apart. Um, others suggested that the data was too limited and small to capture the full uh, variation in size within the population at each stratigraphic horizon. In 1994, Tom Bound, a paleontologist with the United States Geological Survey, led a more in-depth study of Hyopsidus fossils from the Bighorn Basin, including over 2,000 specimens in his study measured into a stratigraphic column. The results showed both examples of punctuated change in equilibrium or stasis and gradual changes in tooth size. At the base of the rock record, a single species, Hyopsis lumisi, does not appear to change at all. But suddenly, around 200 meters above the base of the section, a new species appears and replaces Hyopsis lumisi with Hyopsis simplex, a slightly larger species. This lines up to a climatic event, which likely had a major impact on the existing population reducing its size and resulting in the observed shift to a larger size, a punctuated event. Around 375 meters above the base of the section, two new species appear, the smaller Hyopsis minor and the larger Hyopsis miculus, with a slight delay until the appearance of the largest species, Hyopsis paloensis, which migrated into the basin at this point. There are only a few specimens of an intermediate species named Hyopsis mentalis. Both Hyopsis minor and Hyopsis miculus show gradual decreasing size, particularly after the appearance of the largest species, Hyopsidus paluensis. What's so exciting about this study is that we see a mosaic of both classic punctuated equilibrium, but some examples of more gradual evolution especially when we see multiple species living at the same time and populations shift toward more smaller sizes when a larger species coexisted with the shifting species. A follow-up study demonstrated that in the upper rock layers where multiple species are found, that they partition the environment. Larger species tended to favor environments that had more mature soil horizons or were more thickly forested, where smaller species tended to favor more open habitat with less mature soils. This is likely because um, a large animal with less forest canopy left you more exposed to predators, particularly birds of prey. So more open habitats favored smaller animals. So in uh, 1996, I uh, studied a large collection of Hyopsidus um, that had detailed stratigraphic information from the younger Middle Eocene Bridger Formation of Wyoming. Um, I didn't have as many fossils to study as the Bighorn Basin study in 1994, um, but I had several hundred specimens from various stratigraphic positions. I wanted to see if I saw examples of punctuated and gradual changes in the fossil record like the 1994 paper had of specimens from the Bighorn Basin. I also wanted to look at changes in the morphology or shape of the teeth through time. So for weeks I measured specimens and recorded observed differences in the morphology or shape of the teeth uh, under a microscope. In the end, I found that five species could be identified on the basis of size and morphology of the teeth. In the lower bee beds, there was a smaller species, Hyopsis misculus, and a larger species, Hyopsis polis. In the higher sea beds, there were two larger species, Hyopsis lepidus, and a rare uh, species called Hyopsis marshi, both of which had a higher occurrence of an ectostylic cusp on the lower molars and can be distinguished from earlier Hyopsis musculus and Hyopsis polis. 
In the upper rock layers extending into the D beds, I found the return of the smaller species Hyopsis musculus, which shows a gradual increase in size over time, with the larger species Hyopsis despiadens occurring in the upper D beds. Across these rock layers, the frequency of the occurrence of a broader cusp called a hypocone on the upper third molars increased, much like changes Dabowski observed in his fruit fly experiments, where a rare trait over time becomes the dominant trait within a population. I also found evidence of habitat partitioning, as the smaller species tended to be found in lacustrian or lake deposits, such as limestones, while fluvial or overbank deposits, such as mudstones, had larger species. Hence, there appeared to be a strong geographic component to the occurrence of species of different sizes. And the study demonstrated to me that evolutionary change is best studied with very common fossils, which are collected systematically, recording both the stratigraphic and geographic location as well as the geologic occurrence of the fossils in the rocks. One of the reasons that Hyopsis is unique, and it shows both punctuated and gradual changes, I reason is due to the fragmentation of populations and shifts in population size within and between basins in the American West. This study got me really excited about science. Um, I went on to work on Hyopsis for two more years uh, for my master's degree. I hope I illustrate in this video why very common fossils are useful and interesting to study. One thing is clear, you know, these studies require that common fossils be collected by recording all of the useful information on their occurrence and location in the rock record. A box of fossils lacking locality information is useless. I have a link uh, below in the description if you want to read uh, an additional uh, paper I wrote on Hyopsis fossils from Colorado and comparing them with the fossil record in Wyoming, which you might enjoy if you want to learn more. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned a little more about how to study evolution using the fossil record. I want to thank Brian Clever, Pablo Lozato Figuez, Arcotis 1811, Justin Bovey, Emmett Larson, and Marlo Andreco, and Fred Olney. Thank you everyone for your support on Patreon. If you'd like to learn more about supporting these educational videos on paleontology and geology, uh, check out the link in the description below.